and welcome to Inside Versailles. So, Greg, fascinating episode, lots going on, and Louise de la Vallière is on the way down. Yeah, it's sort of a gradual decline for her. She's had a few years as chief mistress. She's and had now a run. She's had a good run, good run. and she's had a f you know, few pregnancies, a couple of kids, but Louise obviously starting to look elsewhere. And I think she's also starting to feel a bit left out. And uh, we see that scene where she's now starting to think about maybe going to a convent. So the problem is that Louis liked witty, fun women, mm. and Louise was virtuous, but not actually very witty. But Athenay, the lady in waiting to Marie Therese, is really very clever. And that's how it really did happen in real life, isn't it? That actually, while both Louise and the Queen were pregnant, they said, Athenay, will you look after the King? Because they thought she wasn't a threat. Bit of a mistake. There. Classic mistake. Yeah, classic mistake. Inviting exactly. your enemy in, isn't it? Yeah, it's, exactly yeah. the same happened with Edward VIII's mistress. She said, Oh, Wallace, would you look after him while I'm away in America? Oh dear, got back and he was well and truly looked after. Oh, yes. uh, so, uh, Athenay <laughs> is witty, she's fun, and she's also got a pretty mean tongue. She likes to insult people, and Louis thinks that's hilarious, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, Louis likes a strong woman, as long as they're not meddling in politics. No. But, but you know, if they're, if they're sharp and witty and they can give him a bit of a back and forth banter, he enjoys that. And Athenais is a beauty, but she's also whip smart. Louis likes his girls around, he has them around him the whole time, and also he does actually take them to battle with him. Yeah, he's gone on tour with his ladies and he's presumably wanting to show off, he's taking them off to, uh, to watch him fight. But on that note, we should probably get on to war, actually, because that's what Louis loves doing most, and that's what we've seen Louis and Philippe doing in this episode. So I think it's time we go and meet Dr Phil McCluskey. Talk about battle. Hello, Phil. Hi. So, Phil, what's going on in this picture here? So this is a picture of uh, a battle that took place during the War of Devolution. Um, this is uh, Louis that you can see in Here. the foreground. There he is. There. It, right in the middle of the painting, exactly. looking at us, saying, it, look chaps, this is my war. Indeed. Um, this is a piece of royal propaganda because, uh, in actual fact, Louis turned up uh, too late to this battle <laughs> in order to uh, play a real part in it. This is just after the Siege of Lille. Uh, which is uh, Louis personally uh, commands. So they're showing the triumph of the French army here. And maybe this is Philippe possibly here. We're yes, not quite I think sure. so, Could yes. Could be him. Looks quite similar. So he's in the background. Yeah. He's hidden away. Louis here. Look at the triumph. Look at the amazing success we've had. Is, is that representative of what happened in the wars? Yes, and I think the fact, as you pointed out, that uh, Philippe probably played a more prominent role as a commander um, than has been allowed for here. Louis was very concerned and actually quite deeply anxious that he not be uh, outshone by members of his family and uh, Philippe uh, was very much placed in kind of reserve. Even though he was doing all the work? Yeah. What is the War of Devolution? Because, you know, you've introduced that idea. It sounds quite a complicated phrase. It's not a place, so you know, there's no <laughs> town called Devolution. No. What, what is the, the reason for going to war? You know, we hear about the, the Duke of Cassel in, in the drama talking about a pretext for war, so a suggestion that there's something a bit dubious about the cause for war. How has Louis swung this? Well, a lot of the wars in this period actually were based on quite trumped up uh, legal um, oh, arguments. Phil, you're just saying they just went to war for the sake of it? Fancy. Um, <laughs> Fancy. But um, in this case, uh, it's about inheritance. Uh, Louis uh, uses his lawyers to claim that his wife, Marie Therese, has lots of, uh, is basically the, uh, the, 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 the right heir to the Spanish Netherlands based on the fact that uh, at their marriage, she gave up her right to these territories conditional on a dowry. The dowry, however, was never paid. The Spanish Netherlands, it's sort of what we'd say is modern day Belgium and Luxembourg and bits of France Flanders, and Germany. Yeah. Yeah. But also bits of what we now think of as France as well. So Louis is adding territory that we now think of as being part of France. So he's, has he created modern France geographically? He's certainly pushing it in that direction to what uh, we would recognise as France's borders today, which are kind of like the hexagon, uh, yeah. as it's called. So glory, it's vital for a prince, it's vital for a king to go to war. You've got to be glorious. But actually Louis himself, does he really like leading from the front? Yes, I think he does, but I think he also uh, accepts his limitations. Uh, he realises, he's aware that he's not the greatest uh, commander. He actually has plenty of very competent um, generals, so he's happy for those to uh, lead on the battlefield, but he's directing strategy from his cabinet at, uh, at, uh, at Versailles. So he's sort of a weekend warrior. He likes to sort of <laughs> turn up, do sort of a couple of days of, of roughing it, feel like he's a soldier, and then he'll go home to his lovely palace. Yeah, by this stage, he's nearly 30, 
Uh, and I think he realises he's led quite a frivolous life until this point. He needs some serious kind of military glory to prove his manhood. So, in terms of this treaty then, Louis arrives and says, I've signed a treaty, the war is over, Philippe, you don't get to fight anymore, which obviously annoys Philippe because he's enjoying the glory. What is that treaty? And has that been forced upon him? Has he opted into that? What's, what's going on there? So this is the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle. Really, it's not what Louis um, had in mind. His uh, hand has been forced by uh, the Dutch, particularly, because they uh, get very alarmed at uh, Louis XIV uh, advancing towards closer to their borders. As you would. Indeed, as you would. And so they conclude very quickly an alliance with the English and the Swedish. Uh, and this is uh, basically saying, you have to stop there. If you don't stop, then we'll all join forces and force you to And they're it. Protestant, these three nations, this triple alliance. They're Protestant states. France is a Catholic state. Yeah. So there's sort of tension there. But France and the Netherlands, the Dutch, have been allies for, what, a century or so. So is this a sort of new shift in direction for his foreign policy? Is Louis now thinking of the Dutch as the enemy and Spain as in the rear window. He doesn't take the Dutch as a rival, he just thinks of them as um, sort of meddlesome. He thinks it's very ungrateful considering all the, the help that France has uh, given um, to the Dutch over the last century fighting the Spanish. So uh, he decides that they need uh, putting back in their place basically after that. And the other tricky thing for him, of course, is he's married to a Spanish queen. He's got Henriette Anne at the court, who's English. He has friends and allies who are Dutch. Is it ever complicated for him declaring war on a rival nation when he has you know, people from those nations living in his court? No, I think that's uh, fairly standard uh, for this time, is that they accept the part of the, the French dynasty, the, the ruling dynasty now, for all intents and purposes. Unfortunately, on that note, we've run out of time, uh, but thank you, Phil, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Phil. And uh, thank you for watching at home. Uh, hopefully you'll join us next week. Bonsoir. Bonsoir.